again, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Vicente. We are really very honored to have another distinguished guest with us this evening. In this uh, evening chat, or musamara in Arabic. So this is the first act of translation in this evening. We are really very pleased because the guest speaker is a scholar uh, in various areas, uh, history, translation, language, uh, anthropology, and so on and so forth. Vicente obtained his PhD from Cornell University in history, Southeast Asia, minor fields, European intellectual history, anthropology. He also obtained an MA from the same university uh, in, in 1982 and a BA in 1977 from Ateneo de Manila University, History and Philosophy. So, as you can see, he has so many backgrounds. Philosophy, history, language, translation, and so on and so forth. He has held so many positions, which include the following. In 2017, he was president, uh, or to present, sorry, Giovanni and Amni Gastigan, endowed professor of history. From 2003 to 2017, professor at the Department of History, University of Washington, Seattle. From 2000, 2000 to 2003, professor at the Department of Communication, University of California at San Diego. 1990, 2000, associate professor, Department of Communication, University of California, and so on and so forth. He has extensive uh, publications and written so many books. One of them, is the subject of this discussion this evening, which was published in 2016. These motherless tongues, the insurgency of language amid wars of translation. Another book entitled The Promise of the Foreign Nationalism and the Technique Techniques of Translation in the Spanish Philippines was published in 2005. In 2000, he published another book, White Love and Other Events in Filipino History. In 1999, he edited another volume, Figures of Criminality in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Colonial Vietnam. So this is our guest today, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen. I met, I first met uh, Vicente at the shores of the Adriatic in Italy. We had a very nice walk to a nice cream shop, if you can remember Vicente. And we discussed a subject in translation. I was conducting a research and he helped me so much with his tips, thoughts on that particular subject. And we are meeting now again at the shores of another ice cream and another sea, which is translation. Uh, but ever since we have been meeting only online and the meetings have been orchestrated in a climate of catastrophes and attacks. We, he kindly accepted our invitation uh, to talk to us 
in the 2015 conference, TINVOM, via Skype. At the time, there was an attack on the Bardo Museum, National Bardo Museum. So, so many keynote and guest speakers could not make it to Tunis at that time. We are meeting again, but there is another attack, which is the uh, pandemic of uh, coronavirus or the coronavirus attack. So I don't know whether it, we are doomed to meet in catastrophes <laughs> or we are blessed with catastrophes. So catastrophes uh, uh, facilitate or enable us to meet at least online. So this is really an informal exchange. It is not formal. Uh, and I would like to start by asking a question. I will be interviewing Vicente for uh, some uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then I will hand it over to you, dear participants, to uh, give your inputs and ask questions. Let's start from the very beginning, Vicente, your name. I think your name exists in translation. Uh, do you have a story behind your name yeah. and the Spanish yeah. root of your name? Yeah. You have the floor. Yeah, first of all, uh, I, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting me here. It's, it's, a, it's a real uh, pleasure, Hamuda, and everybody else that I, I'm sort of just seeing now on, on, on video. Uh, <clears throat> Hamuda is absolutely correct that uh, it seems that uh, every time we meet, it's in the midst of some sort of a disaster or catastrophe or pandemic or terrorist attack. <clears throat> And it sort of makes me think about how perhaps one can write a whole paper called Translation as Catastrophe, right? But what would be the catastrophe of translation? Uh, <clears throat> what, how is it that, how is it that uh, it's in the midst of catastrophe that new kinds of translations become possible uh, and old forms of translation come back, right? And this is something that I've, I think about once in a while, especially when I'm writing in relation to translation and war, which I've done in the past. Um, well, first of all, thank you for that very, very generous invitation uh, and the evocation of you know, the, the shores of the Adriatic, which is always a very pleasant memory. Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting by way of introduction that you mentioned my name. And I, as I said before, we, we went live that, you know, my name is, is sort of uh, uh, one that exists in translation. It's, a, of course, a Spanish name. It's also a Portuguese name. Uh, the Italian variation is Vincenzo. Uh, there is an Anglo variation, which is Vincent. And uh, of course, the it, lack root word is uh, vincero, you know, which is to conquer. So I'm, you know, supposedly a conqueror. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I was named after my grandfather, uh, but that I have this, I have this very uh, peculiar American nickname, Vince. Uh, which would have been short if my name was Vincent. It would have been more appropriate. But I'm Vicente. And the reason why I have an American. Uh, nickname is because my parents are very fond of Hollywood movies and uh, they were particularly fond of a particular uh, Hollywood movie star in the, in the 60s and so I was named after him. Uh, but, but it does also illustrate, the whole question of naming is very interesting because it also does illustrate uh, the colonial impact uh, in people's identities. You know, if you think of your name as uh, uh, a sort of uh, a crucial index of one's identity. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, uh, it, the indigenous names that existed before the coming of the Spaniards tended to be wiped away. The Spaniards, uh, starting around the mid 19th century, replaced many of the local names with Spanish names. Uh, and the reason was because the governor general at that time decided that it was much easier to collect taxes from people if they could put them down in the tax rolls with Spanish names. So they all required everybody to take Spanish names. Uh, 
and certain villages were assigned the same name, the same last name. Uh, and then, of course, you took your first name from uh, the calendar of the saints because, you know, Christianity was very important. And so it was customary then to look to the liturgical calendar to look for the saint's name for that particular day, and then you adopted that name. Uh, and uh, so, so there is this very interesting colonial uh, context to, uh, to naming, which, you know, which is always a lot of, I mean, I think it's very interesting to, to tell people that. So, yeah. Yeah, great. So the, 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 your thoughts on naming. But you yeah. have uh, uh, a, a, a baby that was born in 2016, and you gave it a name. She's your book. Oh, my title. Yeah. Yeah. So, my, yeah. why motherless tongues? Why well, you this know, name? Why this yeah. title? Yeah. Part of the project of the book was to sort of say that, uh, to sort of question this idea that we have mother tongues, that we have native tongues, because it assumes that we're all born with a language that is natural to us, and that language comes from the mother, right? Hence, mother tongue. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think that that, that, that uh, misses out on a whole range of other experiences around the world. So in my case, for example, uh, I never had a mother tongue in, 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 in a way because I was born in the 19, I was born in 1956, 10 years after the independence of the Philippines in Manila. Uh, my parents came from different parts of the country and their only common tongue was English. And the reason why English was a common tongue was because they didn't speak each other's native tongue. And English was the language that was taught at schools. It was uh, imposed by uh, the United States when the United States colonized the Philippines. Right? Um, and uh, so they spoke English to us, but at the same time, uh, we heard uh, different kinds of vernaculars from uh, the outside, from the street, from popular culture, uh, from the maids we had at home, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the same time, the older generation, my grandfather's generation, was educated in Spanish. So from them, we heard Spanish. Uh, and uh, my, my, my grandmother on my father's side spoke a different kind of, 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 of vernacular. And so I grew up in a, in a household where English was commonly uh, spoken, but at the same time, so, many, so were many, many, many other languages. So the idea of having a mother tongue to me seemed, seemed uh, sort of uh, uh, curious. And I never, I never could uh, think that I, I would have a mother tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Are you saying that the presence of a lingua franca like English, even at an early age, uh, at home, can suppress the mother tongue? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the whole point, is that uh, one of the arguments I make in the book is the way in which you become fluent in a second language is usually by suppressing your first language so that the second becomes primary, the first becomes secondary, right? And the more you suppress the first language, the more fluent you become in the second language. But also, at the same time, the more the first language uh, suffers as it were, right? Uh, and I think that's the situation in many, many colonized parts of the world where the language of the colonizer became the primary language, even if it was introduced belatedly, secondarily. So, and people have had to struggle to recover their native tongues, as it were. But uh, so it is a lingua franca, but there are still some advantages. Are you ho hostile to the idea of having a language that is dominating uh, the, the, the scene and suppressing other languages, despite the fact that it can, or some other people might argue, can offer a common ground of understanding for different people from different backgrounds, different cultures? So, what is your, your, your attitude towards? A lingua yeah. franca and English in yeah. particular, and more particularly American English. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think I, I, I agree with you that there are certain advantages uh, to being fluent in the lingua franca. It offers a number of advantages. Uh, it offers, uh, for example, uh, the ability to be able to join in international conferences, conversations such as this. You know, where yes. I don't have any, I don't have any Arabic, and I'm just. I don't very have glad any Tagalog. That, 
Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like glad that, 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 that most of your students uh, have English, you know, otherwise this would be impossible, right? So certainly, certainly uh, this would be a, a, an example of the way in which uh, uh, being able to speak a lingua franca, which is, which is to say being able to translate, because that's what happens when you speak a lingua franca, you're translating, uh, is able to build bridges, not just bridges, but networks, right? Uh, multiple networks that, that is able to connect people. And I think, I think that that's, that's very useful uh, and, and certainly very fruitful. Uh, the problem, of course, is that there's a second side to this, which is what happens to people who have no access to this lingua franca, people who uh, cannot enjoy the same educational advantages or do not have the same privilege uh, to be able to learn these languages, right? And so what happens is that they end up living in these vernacular worlds, and these vernacular worlds end up being a little bit like a ghetto, you know, which is very difficult for them to leave, even if they wanted to leave, because they don't have the means to do so. So in effect, what a lingua franca does, especially a lingua franca that has colonial roots, that is rooted in colonial history, what it does is it promotes what I've been calling a linguistic hierarchy, right? a, a hierarchy of languages where certain languages are considered to be uh, more important and more valued because they are able to, as it were, uh, introduce you to a larger world, uh, allow you to get a better job, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, versus other languages, in this case, the vernacular languages, which are seen to be somehow inferior, uh, which are seen to be somehow uh, less than uh, uh, ideal. Uh, and, and, and the worlds, as you know, every language is a world, right? And uh, the world uh, of the vernacular languages tend to be regarded as somehow less important. And so you have a uh, social inequality that comes out of this linguistic hierarchy. And that is a problem, right? So that's, that's the flip side. You know, on the one hand, bridges. On the other hand, uh, the problem is not everyone will have equal access. Do you, do you, do you also... Uh think that translation can be used also as an, a force that allows the lingua franca to absorb other languages and to take their richness and to speak on their behalf in the oh, long yes. run. Yes, I, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I have, a, I have a whole paper on this on, on called Linguistic Currencies, on, on the, the role of American English. Uh, in doing this precisely. And I think you could probably say the same thing with French, uh, that in the Francophone world, uh, with, with, and, and as well as in the Anglophone world, what you have is a situation where you have a second language that serves as a lingua franca, which is also a colonial language, uh, and you have uh, uh, people who are you know, members of the elite. Uh, and this is true, I mean, middle class and elites uh, in every formerly colonized country uh, take it as a badge of, of honor, a badge of pride, that they are fluent in the second language, right? But at the same time, you have a situation, I think in many parts of the formerly colonized world, where, where people uh, tend to, as it were, uh, uh, reinvent, reinvent the lingua franca. Uh, rather than, than move towards standardization, they move in an opposite direction, which, which we can think of as creolization. Right? And so the invention of Creole, different various kinds of street slang, uh, and of course, literature. Literature is a very rich source for reinventing the second language, reappropriating the second language. Uh, and I think what you, when you have in art, in literature, in popular music, in street language, are various attempts to vernacularize uh, the lingua franca, turn it into something other than itself. And so what you have is a different kind of translation practice uh, with, with Francophone literature, with Anglophone literature, with hip hop, with uh, uh, street slang, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, code switching, you know, when people code switch a lot, uh, what they do is they take the lingua franca and uh, repurpose it into another kind of vernacular. Do you think that translation can also uh, act as a third code, a third language? In, and uh, if yes, can it be elevated 
to the status of a lingua franca, replacing a one language that belongs to a particular context, to a particular mm -hmm. community, and it is uh, translation will be the uh, will will be the uh, belonging of no one. So it is there, and uh, it is universal. Uh, and no one can claim to dom uh, to have the lingua franca and using the language to dominate other languages, other people, and other communities. Mm -hmm. Well, I, first of all, I, I, tr translation itself is not a language; it's a practice you know, of of trying to move from one language to another, or trying to move within the same language. Right? We, we have to remember that the translation always exists inter lingually, that is between languages, but also intralingually within the same language, right? which we're always translating within the same language. Uh, and uh, an example of this is if you look at the dictionary, right? A, so one word is translated by other words, right? So there's intralingual translation. Now, uh, with, with, the, with the question of the lingua franca, the, a, a kind of, is it possible to have a universal lingua franca? I think I think that's the dream. I think that's in many for some people for some people, they see that as you know a real possibility, especially with globalization, uh, with the expansion of markets. Uh, the assumption is that you know we should have we should have a common language, right? Uh, and of course, in the language of capitalism, that common language is called money, right? Uh, that uh, if I if I give you money, you understand exactly what that is, and you give me money back, and we can have a conversation using money, right? Uh, but the problem, of course, is it's, it's very it's very narrow. It's very reductive, uh, and again, it brings up this whole question of uh, inequality. What happens when some people have more money than others? What happens when some people are more fluent in a particular lingua franca than others? Um, and then, of course, what happens to all those other languages, which is to say, all those other linguistic worlds that are excluded or that are marginalized, uh, that cannot enter. Uh, into the marketplace, as it were, are they simply abandoned? Are they simply uh, forgotten? Uh, so these are these are questions of ultimately questions of power, not just questions of, of, of uh, whenever the question of translation comes up and the question of the lingua franca comes up. There's always the question of power, right, and power relations that are established when one says something in one language versus another. So. So the question of power, is translation also a power that can be used also to uh, defend one's own language? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. And, and, and I think that that's uh, the, history, the history of, for example, the, 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 the development of national languages uh, are precisely all about using translation as a kind of mechanism as, as, as a mechanism of power for uh, uh, elevating one particular language over others. So, and this is true, I think, with all national languages, right? When you think about, when you think about French, I mean, you know, the, the elevation of French as a national language of France is at the expense of other uh, vernacular languages all over France, right? Same thing with Spanish. Uh, the, the national language is Castilian, but it's now called Spanish, but that means that all the other Spanish languages are marginalized. And I, I suspect in, in Tunisia, it's the same thing. The same kind thing. of uh, Arabic that's spoken in Tunisia is a standardized Arabic that means basically repressing a whole bunch of other uh, vernaculars, right? Yes. Uh, so Mo Morocco and so forth. Uh, so, so to me, uh, the question of power is always there. Whenever one translates, one opens up the possibility of new worlds, of new communication, of new bridges, but at the same time, there is a cost, there is a price, uh, in the sense that certain things are repressed, certain things are marginalized. Uh, and so the question is, you know, what, what happens in the wake of that repression? Yeah, and, and when there is power, there will be a counter, also force, to resist that power, and this right. will create a climate of friction and tension. So right. my That's question right. is uh, now about languages. Do you think that languages are at war 
Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly one of the subtitles of my essay. Yeah, the, I mean, the subtitle of the book is the war of uh, the war of translation. Uh, you know, that's one way of thinking about translation, right? Uh, that there's always a built-in tension in translation, whether you're doing literary translation or whether you're doing, uh, you know, uh, a sort of uh, translation in say in a diplomatic context or whether you're doing translation in a technical context, I think there's always going to be friction. There's always going to be tension. Why? Very simple. It's because there's no such thing as a perfect translation, right? Every translation uh, opens up the possibility, not just the possibility, but the necessity of mistranslation, right? Because you can always translate a phrase or a word or a sentence one way instead of another, and depending on how you translate it, the meaning will change, right? The meaning ca cannot be uh, totally consistent with every kind of translation that you make. And so there will always be a need for a new translation, right? Every translation already anticipates a new translation insofar as it is predicated, it is based not just on the possibility, but on the risk of this translation. So translation is very risky. It's extremely risky. It, 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 it uh, necessitates on the part of the translator, it necessitates a whole series of decisions, right? You have to make a decision. Should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? Should I say it this way? Should I say it that way? What happens if I mistranslate in one way versus mistranslate in another way? And that, so that, by, by decision, that, do that's you mean, very risky. Yeah. Do you mean the, the, uh, the, the decisions at the micro level means at the level of the translator? with dealing with texts or at the macro level with states and colonial powers, for example, and this is perhaps in a, a linguistic policy as a whole, which yeah, level? Yeah I, I, yeah, I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, if you're a literary translator, you feel it every time you, 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 you go through a text and you, and, 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 and you try to decide, you know, if, if I say that this is, this is uh, uh, a, a, a sort of, you know, one kind of moon, uh, will it mean something else if I say it, you know, in another language? Uh, but also on the state level, on the policy level, the questions of translation, especially when you start to think about educate, public education, when you start to think about policies and so forth, uh, the question of mistranslation uh, becomes uh, fraught, extremely fraught. And uh, as I said, and of course, the most fraught uh, sites of translation is war. Whenever you have war, right, uh, invading troops, they always need translation. Otherwise, they don't know who to shoot. They don't know, they don't know where to go. They don't know where to find food, right? And so they always uh, find somebody to translate these things for them. And then, I, as I've tried to demonstrate in my, in my discussion on the uh, U.S. occupation of uh, uh, Iraq, uh, there's always this tendency, can you trust your translator? Right? Yes. Is your translator going to be a traitor, as they say? Uh, yeah. so, so translation so, exists only at the yeah. firing line? And uh, yeah, Forrest is only at the firing line? You could say that. You could say that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, but, but what this does is it raises very serious ethical questions, right? Yeah. That is to say, sure. questions on the level of what should I do? If you're a translator, and let's say you agree to translate for an occupying force, uh, that you're in a terrible situation, right? True. Because if you translate for them, uh, then uh, your family might disown you or your friends will dis disavow you because you're seen as part of the enemy. But then you can say, oh, well, I'm only doing this to make things easier for everybody else, right? So they won't shoot the wrong person, you know, and so forth and so on. So, so it, 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 there are many, many political and ethical issues Whatever the question of trans especially the question of loyalty, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and uh, translation and languages have been used as a weapon of war by yes. colonial powers in Latin America, by Spain, and in the Philippines, uh, by France, by uh, the British Empire. So can you tell us more about how? language and translation have been weaponized uh, to, to achieve uh, political uh, 
purposes and even uh, some gains in, in, in the uh, occupied territories. Yeah, it, well, it, it, it's um, uh, a couple of examples, right? So one of my essays, I talk about the U.S. occupation of Iraq and how one of the most difficult tasks is communication. An occupying force will always have to confront the problem of the fact that of, of linguistic difference that, that you know one side speaks a different language than theirs and so they will need to find someone to mediate to bridge that difference uh, and so translation becomes extremely important in fact it was so important that the u.s state department uh, produced a manual uh, outlining the importance of language and the importance of translation and they describe translation as part of a complex weapons system. So it was the US military itself that designated translation as a weapon, right? Uh, and, and they've poured a lot of money uh, into developing automatic translation systems, which have been less than perfect, as you know. Uh, and they've also, they also have a school of translation, a language school in California, in Monterey, California, uh, where they teach uh, uh, officers in different languages. Uh, and these languages, of course, have to do with those parts of the world that the United States has a, has a geopolitical interest in. I think this follows in the, in the example, or this is uh, very much in the pattern of what uh, British uh, uh, Empire did, the British Empire at its heyday, uh, also trained its its uh, colonial officials in various languages uh, in linguistics and so forth uh, to be able to handle the the task of administering uh, natives. Uh, I think the same thing was true in France, where you know, French colonizers had to learn, and of course the Dutch, uh, same thing as well. So so we can see how the problem of language is central to the uh, to the question of colonial occupation. And therefore, the, 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 the task of translation uh, uh, has a, has a very, has a very uh, crucial role, plays a very crucial role in uh, the ability to be able to impose colonial rule on an occupied uh, population. I must say, though, just to end this part, that the flip side is also true. Not only is it important for colonizers, it is also important for the colonized. Because the colonized, in order to be able to negotiate, to deal, and to resist the colonizer, right, uh, must be able to seize on certain linguistic resources. You know, I guess language is a resource, right? So they, they either they learn the language of the colonizer to be able to talk back, or they reinvent the vernacular in order to make it less uh, available. Uh, as it were, to colonial interests. So and, what is the, 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 yeah. the force, the, the real force that makes a colonizer exercising his hegemony over the colonized and the colonized to reply back by fierce resistance? There must be something, some force in, 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 that, in that language. So what is the force? We, we, I, we've studied pragmatics and discourse analysis, yeah, and we've yeah. seen that there are th some speech acts in the language. Yes, yes, but yeah, yeah. other than that, uh, it, it, so what, what, is, what is the nature of that force? Well, yeah, I, I think it's hard to answer, but I think one way to think about that force is to give it a name, and the name is communication. Right? Communication is a very forceful act. Because when something communicates, two things happen. One is, usually when we think about communication, we think about uh, uh, producing meaning and transmitting meaning, right? Communication is the transmission of meaning from one language to another, from one medium to another. But communication can also exist in a much more elementary form, much more fundamental form, which is communication has to do with contact. As in, for example, you have an earthquake. And this earthquake means that the ground shifts and they come into contact. And the contact produces violence. Or, for example, when a police comes up to you and, and decides to slam you against the wall, that act of violence is a form of communication. Because what the police does is he's sending you a message, which is that he's the one in control. He's the one who can violate your space and destroy your body if he wants to. 
So you see how communication always brings with it not just the possibility of meaning, but the force of contact. And that force of contact, of course, establishes, once again, a power relation. So I will uh, finish with this question before I yeah. open it up to the, to the room and other participants. Uh, my question has to do with 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 uh, the uh, the description of translation as a bridge, mm -hmm. bridge uh, between cultures, bridge between uh, communities, societies. Um, you know, the world now is characterized and doomed by so many catastrophes, uh, so many attacks. Uh, so is there still room to portray translation as a bridge between nations and the translator can be uh, presented as a messenger of peace yes. and acculturation yes. between yeah. nations? You know, you know, that's an excellent question because I think that, that puts the question of translation studies at the center of the humanities and the social science. Let me say this. I think, yes, I agree with the image or the metaphor of translation as a bridge, but only if we think of this bridge as booby-trapped, as loaded with all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, dangers with bombs and so forth, right? Uh, and so in that sense, uh, we continue building bridges, but we also have to realize the way in which these bridges can be uh, both a source of contact, uh, communication, but also a source of violence, right? Uh, which we always have to, to live with. So that's, that's one way of thinking about uh, translation as a bridge. But there's another way. I always like to think that there's always, there's always another way. And the other way is that we could think of translation as, you know, in the broader sense of the word, translation is an act of love, right? That when we, especially literary translation, that when we translate a literary text and we translate the poem, it's because there's something about the poem that draws us to it. There's something that we feel, a different kind of force. And this time, it's not the force of violence. It's not simply a kind of power relationship. Rather, it's the force of what you might say, communion. So there's communication, but there's also communion, right? There's, there's, the, there's the idea that somehow uh, the poem or the, the novel that we're translating speaks to us and speaks to us in a different way. And by translating, translating becomes a way of turning your attention, of listening, and by listening, embracing what it is that's being said. So translation becomes not an act of hostility, as in war, translation becomes an act of hospitality. So it's a way of moving from hostility to hospitality, from war to love. Uh, the, and, and from, com from communication as a form of simply delivering meaning to communication as a way of communion, of communing, right? And communing with the other, uh, because that's, that's essentially what it means to translate is to, is to commune with the other, to, to welcome, as it were, the other into your house uh, and to, and to uh, make that, that other uh, feel as if they belong without imprisoning them, because that's the other side of hospitality, is you, the, the guest can also at some point feel like a hostage, right? So, so you want hospitality, but you don't want to make the guest a hostage. Right? So that's what you do. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. but in this, in this uh, same vein, uh, so many languages, they have built fences and walls mm -hmm. to protect themselves against the alien, uh, against... Uh, uh, people who are trying to learn that language to uh, to spy for another nation for another culture mm -hmm. uh, so can you uh, how can you see the bridge in this case so bridge over those fences or uh, being in harmony with those fences and walls yeah uh, I think that uh, uh, you know that's really interesting you know I, are bridges also kinds of walls? Are they also kinds of fences? Because, of course, the thing about bridges is that some of them, in fact, many of them, have checkpoints, right? So uh, you can't cross unless you, you submit yourself to the checkpoint, right? So in a way, they're not really, they're not really uh, uh, different 
Every bridge requires a checkpoint. Every checkpoint is a kind of bridge that you can cross into, uh, which is why I, I think that that it, it's it, it, the idea of spying, uh, surveillance. Uh, that's certainly certainly part of, of of translation, especially when you when you begin to have uh, very elaborate uh, uh, technologies of of surveillance, right? Because uh, computational technologies are all forms of translation anyway. So. Uh, with, and, and, and again, I come back. I come back to the question of the alternative. What's the alternative? Right? What's the alternative to thinking about translation as a weapon, as a, a, a checkpoint, as a bridge? And I think that alternative is, as I said, uh, uh, translation as uh, a practice of hospitality, of welcoming the other, of turning one's language into a home uh, within which the other can come. And, 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 and become part of oneself and where you yourself can become part of the other. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You have the floor, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question and enrich this discussion. So I can see two requests, uh, Muhammad Salah Isa and then uh, Duha Mabrook. Muhammad Salah, you have the floor. Thank you. Greetings. Uh, sir, you mentioned Hello. that suppressing one's native language would make the second language the primary one. Would you further clarify? Because I'd argue that a well-versed translator or anyone who actively uses both languages can strike a balance. And you also mentioned how your grandfather spoke Spanish because he was forced to learn it, but your parents spoke English. And I'd say because most of their interaction are with their classmates and so on. Mm -hmm. So they basically started to spread their native language since they barely use it. And I would say the setting, the environment, the people with whom you have to interact affects our choice of the primary language. And my second question is as follows. Uh, it's kind of more related to sociolinguistics and to Tunisian context. Uh, but due to the lack of research done, there is few studies that argue that Tunisian Arabic is not a dialect, but rather a dependent, an independent language. What are your thoughts regarding this matter? Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, let me answer the, the, the second question because I probably know a lot less about it uh, than I do about the first. Uh, with regard to the second question on Tunisian Arabic, uh, is it a, a dialect or is it a real language? You know, the thing is that I don't like the word dialect. I don't think, it's because dialect is a way of, of saying that it's not a real language, that it's somehow inferior. I think all dialects are language, uh, languages in, in and of themselves. Uh, and at some point, uh, could become a lingua franca, could become standardized, uh, but the, 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 in, in because of certain certain historical and and, and political conditions, uh, they remain marginalized. So so yeah, I mean it's it's uh, the question of is something a dialect or is it a real language? I think that that's a that's a, a, a in a, in a way uh, a. a, a uh, it's not. It's not a very. It's not a very interesting question. I mean, it's not. In other words, it's. It's. It's not a real. It's a distinction without a difference. The second question about uh, uh, can you strike a balance between the lingua franca and your mother tongue? Sorry, um, Vicente. Before you yes. move to the second question, it's still yeah. in, the, in the first question, uh, yeah. the, the dialect and 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 the languages. Uh, some uh, some people might argue uh, that. Uh, some colonial powers, they uh, worked with some communities within the same nation and they told them that uh, this, this code is a whole, a fully fledged language and they started to apply through this approach a, a sort of a divide and rule policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how do you, how do you, uh, see this policy and uh, the hierarchy of languages uh, th that you have mentioned early on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you mean, you mean uh, they, they will designate, the colonial power will designate certain languages that's more important than others? Is that what you're no, saying? They are, for example, let's uh, take the context of Tunisia. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the French colonial power 
invading Tunisia and Algeria, and they start to disseminate. This is a fully fledged language, Tunisian Arabic. It's not mm -hmm. uh, Arabic, standard Arabic is a separate language. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, in order to kill any resistance and solidarity between the Arab nations, ah. like Algerians, and uh, means to to present them as different Algerians oh, and nice. Tunisians, uh, and not to have that solidarity against that colonial power. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. So uh, yeah. In, in other words, uh, reinventing Arabic and then and then and then classifying it and saying that that. Uh, uh, there are all these differences in order to be able to control uh, different regions much more effectively. Yeah, uh, I I don't know because I, I I don't know enough about the history of that of that linguistic colonization uh, to be able to pronounce it. Except except of course uh, to be to be skeptical of French claims, right? Uh, but then at the same time uh, to ask how uh, Tunisians themselves and Algerians themselves have responded. Right, uh, and and which Algerians, which Tunisians, have uh, uh, taken on the task of of nationalizing uh, what has been essentially a colonial imposition, uh, and 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 you know how how that's worked out. So I mean that's that's the that's very sketchy, but it's it's as far as I can go because I don't know much. But it is a very interesting question, uh, uh, it, you know, and in some ways it reminds me. A little bit of the fate of English in the United States, because originally uh, English was not really the most widely spoken language. There was a whole debate as to whether or not English should even be the language in the U.S. at the beginning, 1776, after the revolution against the British. Uh, yeah. So, I, anyway, so that's 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 you know what I would I would say. Um, now, the the the, the second the first question though. It was interesting because I understood that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood that to be a question about bilingualism, right? Because the bilingual, someone who's fully bilingual is fully comfortable, or trilingualism, or quadrilingualism, or whatever, that they're fully comfortable shifting from one language to another, uh, but, but and, 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 you know, which is great. It's a talent I don't have. Uh, I wish I had it, but I don't have it. But but uh, the thing about bilingualism or trilingualism or whatever is that when you switch from one language to another, right, it means that uh, uh, it's like moving from uh, one one world to another. Uh, you, you have to uh, momentarily leave behind uh, this language, your first language or your second language or whatever, and speak this other language, right? Uh, and so bilingualism itself requires not just the ability to balance the two languages, uh, but a balancing act that requires you to shut off one language as you speak another and then you go back again. Uh, so there's still a kind of repression uh, that goes on. Now, the interesting question for me is what happens when you can't repress, when you, you, you can't shut off you end up speaking a third language, which is the language of Creole. You end up mixing registers, uh, and and a third, you know, and and you see this with lots of families that are bilingual. Is that you know you're speaking Arab one minute, and then you make a switch to French, and then back again to Arab, and then you pronounce certain words that are supposed to be French and Arabic, and blah 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 blah. So it it you go back and forth, and this code switching essentially generates a third language, right? Uh, but then when you have to speak to somebody, you can only speak French and you only speak in French and vice versa in Arabic as well. So, so you're actually speaking three languages instead of just two. Yeah. So. Um, hello, it's my turn, right? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to it's thank you turn. for... Yes. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Vincent. Is it Vincent? I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Uh, yeah. For taking us uh, Raphael, Raphael, yeah. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Raphael, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for taking us on uh, the political intersection of translation because uh, we've been always technical about it and uh, learning how to become a better translator, etc. And I do believe like that everything is political and... Um, sure. Would you like me to wait? No, 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 go ahead, please. please go ahead, please. go ahead, please. 
And um, drawing on Spivak's politics of translation, um, I believe that the social movements are being pink washed or being colored in a certain imperialistic um, culture. Culture, and thus uh, my question is: um, How do we, as plurilinguals or as translators, fight off the tide, uh, the tsunami of the culture that we find in movies and music and everything? Because um, even private schools are teaching English and French before Arabic sometimes in some schools or some areas. I mean, the the generations are becoming more faded as they go and they are like uh, the sociolinguist uh, book they are born liquid they have an identity crisis like what should we do i mean to fight off this tides yeah Thank you. yeah uh, let, let, let me ask you a question when, when did uh, uh when did they start teaching english in tunisia um, I think the late, the recently, these years, I mean, three, four years, I, I'm not sure if someone has the uh -huh. information. And, and it's required from starting what level? Um, but it's not public schools, it's in private schools. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah, second year, I think seven years old or something like that. But French is required in public schools at um, eight. So, so French continues to be the dominant lingua franca yes and no because the, the new generation with a neo-colonialism they speak more english than french french huh. is really yes fr french is lo losing ground in tunisia it is uh -huh. yeah yeah and and so so that's a very interesting phenomenon uh and and you might want to ask yourself why is that why is why is all of a sudden french losing ground when it used to be I mean, and this is true all over the world. I think it's not just in Tunisia. All over yeah, the world. Yeah, they, they, they uh, see in English is the that. lingua franca, and yeah, yeah. they can have better opportunities with English worldwide than with French. Exactly. So yeah. So it's it's very much a function of uh, you know, the, for want of a better word, globalization, which means the globalization of of the marketplace of capitalist marketplaces, right? Um, so I think that that might help to frame your question is to say, well, if, if, if you have this, this phenomenon of English hegemony and American English hegemony, less British English, but American English hegemony, right? It, it, it does, perhaps that has to do with, with the hegemony of a certain kind of uh, uh, capitalism uh, where people are drawn to think of their lives as something that has to be, uh, you know, uh, that has to, to pursue a particular kind of path where English becomes an important instrument, right? Uh, and so, so, so the question of how do you fight against that, how do you resist it, is going to have to be connected with how do you respond to the problem of globalization. If I may add, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's also the, this phenomenon that is linked to languages speaking French or English more than Arabic, it became an indicator of class. So if you are from a certain class, you are required somehow like subliminally the, to speak those languages at an early age. And it's a source of pride, let's say for parents mm -hmm. and for the person him, him or herself. And so the phenomenon is so overwhelming that I don't mm -hmm. see a way of resisting it or mm -hmm. a way of insurgence, as you mm -hmm. have put it. Mm -hmm. What has happened to Arabic? Uh, I think. What's the, what's the status of Arabic? As in the classical Arabic, I think we, we don't use it in our daily lives. Um, we only read it in literature, we read it in school, we use it in. Uh, and instructional and institutions okay so mm -hmm. even when we speak with each other in a formal way it's still tunisian so arabic mm -hmm. and classical is old-fashioned and less used much less used mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and with your friends with your family what, what do people normally speak also tunisian dialect mixed with mm -hmm. uh, some french words even english sometimes so yeah yeah, so, so that's very interesting in itself. It's a phenomenon where, where all these different languages become creolized and become, as it were, uh, uh, True. You, you end up reinventing them. Uh, but you do so 
within a certain intimate context, right? So, True. but it is sort of a pigeon uh, rather than a creole. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Uh, I think seventy to eighty percent uh, of the vocabulary and everything in the Tunisian dialect is coming from standard Arabic. Uh, with uh, an Italian influence, Spanish influence, Berber influence. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so this makes it really uh, very complex to decide whether it is a fully-fledged language, a mm -hmm. um, level within an overall uh, language. So yeah, it's, uh, and there is a heated debate on that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But you know that that brings up the question of is there is there such a thing as pure as a pure language, or are languages already mixed, uh, and that you have uh, schools and other officials who try to standardize, who try to quote unquote purify these languages, but uh, they they can never be. I mean, the only way languages grow is if they take on foreign influences, right? So a language can never be pure in that sense. Um, and so you can, you can push this in the direction and say, you know, even if we speak uh, uh, one language, we're already speaking many languages, right? Or, or what, what Derrida would call a monolingualism of the other, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So let's take uh, Mahdi Gwia. Uh, hello. So my question is uh, the following. Why do colonial force, forces always aim to suppress the languages of the colonized countries? And does translation play a role in that suppression? Yeah, yeah, no, because I mean, when you think about colonialism, colonialism is about how to establish rule over the native population, right? And, and uh, uh, that, that uh, for the most part, colonizers will always use their language as the language of rule. Uh, and and at the same time, they, they tend to be very interested in in the native language, and so there always there will always be uh, attempts at translating uh, these native languages in order to better control uh, the population. So yeah, so 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 uh, it, it, this makes this makes the question of not just colonialism but politics in general uh, uh, always to have, to have a linguistic aspect. There's always a linguistic aspect, and therefore there's always the problem of translation whenever you introduce the problem of politics, whether it's colonial or otherwise. Thank you. Uh, Khadija? Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for Hi. this uh, insightful conversation. Uh, you made a very interesting point about power relations and uh, hi hierarchy vis-a-vis -vis language and translation. And this makes me think of uh, speakers of lesser used languages or minority languages during this moment of history. Um, this makes me think of maybe their lack of access to information about mm -hmm. COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. because most information and research is being communicated in uh, English and uh, privileged languages, if I may say. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know, what's your take on that, especially in relationship with uh, post-colonialism and your field yeah. of yeah. research? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think that's, that's a really important point, and I, I'm not sure yet how to think about it, except to say that uh, certainly in the face of pandemics, like the pandemic that we have right now, uh, the state plays a very important role, right? Uh, and it's usually the state that takes charge of public health measures, of letting the public know what they should be doing in order to prevent themselves from being infected and infecting others. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, what is the language that they use to do that? Uh, globally, English, of course, is widespread, it's everywhere. But I think depending on the countries, right, you can look at different countries and they will always have uh, things in the national language. Uh, sometimes they'll have it translated in the vernacular. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I don't know what it's like in Tunisia. It's just a, the, the language of public health must be Arabic, right? I mean, it just can't be English or, or French because it has to be transmitted and it has to be available to everybody you know, to to the widest number of population so 
So some of it might be in English, but I imagine it would be in a language that the majority of the people will understand. Um, so the question of public health always brings up the question of well, what's, what's the language appropriate to communicating with as wide a variety of people as possible. Um, and then, so yeah, that I, you know, that, that's, where I would, that's where I would think about it, but I'm sure perhaps people, other people have other thoughts about this matter. Um, Vicente, we have another question from Samar. Uh, she says, quote, but thank you very much for the great talk. My question is, do you consider the directionality of translation to and from a language to play a role in viewing translation as a source of violence or as a commune? And ah, yeah, yeah. I think it can happen either way. Uh, it, it, one would have to look at a specific, specific situation, you know, like, for example, uh, if... Uh, if you're an immigrant and the police and you're in a you know, country where you don't know the language very well, or you're a visitor in your country, you don't know the language very well. And the police comes up and asks for your papers and you can't understand the police and the police thinks that you're hiding something. And so all of a sudden you have this, this complex miscommunication that takes place. Right. Uh, and, and what you have is in some ways the failure of translation, right? And the failure of translation, uh, we often tend to experience as frustrating and in some cases, very dangerous. Yeah, this is a scenario with police, for example, can be very dangerous. Uh, so in that sense, it's, 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 it's a foreign language that comes to at you rather than a foreign language that you're trying to, to communicate. Uh, so, so you can see how it, it, it can be either way, yeah. Thank you, Afif yeah. Bujama. Please. Yes, thank you so much for this interesting topic. So, um, as you mentioned, loyalty in translation. My question is very often asked and is very controversial. Should the translator be loyal to the source discourse, either written or spoken discourse, especially in times of wars and conflicts, as it is the heart of today's topic? Or should the translator be an agent of peace, which would make him or her less faithful to the original text? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, it's so difficult, I mean, to answer that question. It's a very good question. It's an excellent question. But it's very difficult because, they, again, a lot of it depends on the context, right? Uh, usually when we think of translation in the interest of peace, we think especially of diplomacy. Right. So if you work for the EU or you work for the UN or other international commissions, you know, translation plays a really important role in terms of being able to build up uh, relations, you know, with different countries. So you don't go to war, right? Diplomacy becomes a way of avoiding uh, going to war. But then when you think about it, uh, there's a certain limit to what translation can do uh, to avoid war in that, in the sense that uh, and this has to do with diplomacy itself. The problem with diplomacy is, of course, diplomacy. Some people have talked about diplomacy as war by other means, <laughs> right? What, what diplomacy does is it builds up a set of conditions and a set of networks that means that every member has to obey or has to accede, uh, has, to, has to conform to those, to those conditions. And if they don't, then they become subject to sanctions, or they become subject to occupation and so forth and so on. So, so uh, you know, uh, the fate of uh, a place like Iran, for example, is very interesting. You know, because Iran is you know often treated as a kind of pariah, so it's subject to all sorts of of, of sanctions. Uh, so here you have a situation where it's not exactly war, but it's not exactly peace either, right? Uh, and and. Uh, so, so it's very difficult for the translator to decide, uh, the individual translator uh, to decide, you know, am I going to be an agent for peace or am I going to be an agent for war? Uh, again, a lot of it depends on, on, on the particular context, right? So, so um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I wish I could, I could elaborate on that more, but that's, that's at the moment, uh, you would have to give me more details, more information, sure. and, and maybe I can respond, yeah. Yeah. Taqwa. 
Hello, sir. It's an honor to have you here today. Hello. So my question is, uh, when, it, when a... Sorry, Taqwa, we lost you. Okay. We lost your voice. Yes, now it's back. Go ahead, please. When a colonizing, powerful lingua franca, lingua franca country leaves a colonized country, it leaves also its language behind, giving the opportunity for learning and using a new language that becomes very useful, especially in the market. On the ground of that, do you think colonization is a justifiable since it brings, it brings into force globalization? Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, well, I never think colonization is justifiable. <laughs> I think colonization is, uh, I mean, it's always going to be an act of power that's always going to privilege some at the expense of others. Uh, and so uh, I always, I'm, I, I guess I'm more interested in decolonization and how we can move towards a, a decolonized future. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to think of the role of translation and language in allowing us to move towards a decolonized future, uh, even if at this point it seems very difficult, right? But 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 I think it's something that that, that we can try, and we have examples from the past uh, as to how people tried to use language in order to to begin to imagine a, a decolonized world. Uh, yeah, so so that would be my 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 response. It's never. I don't think colonization is ever justifiable. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, how do you see decolonization in this new age, new ah, digital yeah. age? Yeah, yeah, that's that's like the, the subject of many, many intense debates right now, right? Uh, in fact, I was just looking at this book called Decolonizing Decolonization. <laughs> because, because there's a sense that sometimes people talk about decolonization, but it just results in recolonization. So, yes. so uh, uh, right now, for example, one of the, one of the areas where people are, are talking about decolonization is in the question of climate change. Yes. Right? Uh, how can we move towards uh, a climate, uh, sort of you know, reversing climate change unless we change the conditions that allow for for climate change, uh, conditions which are inherited directly True. from uh, the colonial past, right? Uh, industries, uh, sort of attitudes towards nature, uh, and so forth and so on. So, so, uh, uh, so de decolonization is is subject of a subject of great debate, and I think uh, it, there's no there's no uh, I don't think there's a universal discourse about decolonization right now. It's not like in the 60s or in the 70s where you had uh, a, a sort of, you know, uh, a discourse about, about anti-colonial liberation, right? And, and, and liberation or emancipation, there was, a lot of it was articulated to the language either of uh, liberal democracy or uh, Marxist socialism, yeah? Marxism played a very important role in during that history of projecting a possible future uh, free from colonial rule. And I think what's happened today is that, you know, Marxism has kind of imploded. Uh, there are attempts to sort of revitalize it, reinvent it, uh, but it hasn't reached a kind of global limit at this uh, global uh, reach uh, at this moment. So I, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I think people are still experimenting. Uh, that's the best word I can use. They're still yeah. experimenting about different ways of thinking, different ways of doing uh, uh, deglobalizing practices. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Nisreen Talus. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. For being our guest uh, today. My question is the following Can we say that untranslatability is the reason behind the mixed registers? Uh, from the colonized uh, language and the um, colonized uh, colonizer, or is it the outcome of the peer pressure from the uh, elite to be part of that social uh, image standard? Mm, could, can, it, can, could you could you, do you mind repeating the, the question? Okay, uh, can we say that the untranslatability is the reason? leading to the mixed registers between the colonized language and the colonizer language? Or is it the, the outcome of the need to be part of a social image uh, that is uh, after the colonization? 
Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question of untranslatability is, is very interesting. Several other people have written about it, of course. Uh, my, own, my own view is that uh, uh, untranslatability, again, is uh, built into the possibility of translation, right? That, that, that translation will always have a limit. Right? And that limit uh, has to do with the fact that uh, uh, there's a certain, there's always going to be a certain foreignness uh, to, to, to language. Uh, we, the, 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 I think one of the, one of the uh, great illusions, one of the great humanistic illusions is this idea that somehow language is something that is uh, humanly controllable, that, that humans control language. But of course we know for a fact that language tends to also control us, right? So there's something about language that always exceeds human agency and human capacity to control it. Uh, and, and, and for that reason, uh, there's always going to be something beyond what we can translate uh, in a given speech. Uh, and and, and that, that, that untranslatability, therefore, is not something that is accidental. It's not something that is uh, a sort of secondary. It is structurally built into uh, the very possibility of speaking. Uh, there's always something that can be left, that will always be left unsaid, not because there are no words for it, but the words elude us. You know, as we say, the words elude us. It's always greater than us, right? Uh, so that would be my that would be my my response to uh, the question on on translatability. And does it does it therefore result in the emergence? I think the the other question is: Does it result in the emergence of a, a kind of Creole or mixed mixed language? I, I I think so too, because I think the fact that that we all uh, speak in, in one form or the other, we all speak some kind of mixed, we all sp speak in mixed registers, right? Uh, some kind of modified pigeon, if you will, uh, suggests the fact that, that uh, the very act of speaking requires supplementation, right? We always, in, in, in trying to arrive at uh, some, kind of, some kind of coherent speech, we always end up supplementing our speech uh, our language with other languages, right? And so the very act of supplementation uh, means that uh, we are, are faded, right? we are consigned to always uh, speaking in, in, in mixed registers, right? Uh, because one word is never enough, uh, that word always has to be supplemented by another word, uh, same with images, same with phrases, same with sentences, right? So, so untranslatability uh, in some ways is uh, necess or, 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 or predicated on a constant supplementation of, of, of speech. So, uh, and for that reason, we're always going to be speaking in mixed registers. This question of bidirectionality of influence and control, a human being and the language, reminds me of the same relationship between a human being and a machine. Mm -hmm. uh, the human being invented the machine and uh, claiming that he is controlling it fully, but now it turns that out that it is the machine now that is starting to control a human being. So do you yeah. mean that language in this sense is like a machine or uh, a weapon? Th th certainly, yeah, certainly, certainly an aspect of, of language that is mechanical, right? And, and that aspect of language that's mechanical is called grammar. Right. That, that's why when we learn a language, we, have, when we learn the grammar. It's like you, you have to submit your uh, basically a, a non-human thing, which is what grammar is. Right. You have to repeat it. You have to uh, uh, figure out the different combinations and so forth and so on. Uh, of course, this this idea of human and machine that you know it's uh, Frankenstein, right? Uh, Mary Shelley you know, first thought, thought thought about this, uh, and 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 so. We're, what, what, what translation does is it is it uh, it forces us to uh, come to terms, come to terms with this undecidability, with this this undecidable relationship between uh, human and machine, or between human and language, right? Uh, while we we and, and again to sort of you know paraphrase some people who've written about this, while we speak language, uh, language also speaks us, right? Uh, we're hailed 
uh, by the language of others. And, and no one knows this more than the translator. The translator would read a text in a foreign language and can feel that foreign language hailing him or her, telling him, look, pay attention. What does this sound like otherwise, right? Uh, and that, that's, that's why we're drawn, I think, to translate the texts. So. Thank you. Um, so we have, uh, who else? Tasneem uh, Jberi. Yes, hello? Yes, hi. Hello? Yes, hi. Hello. hello. Yeah, Thank hello. you for this discussion. I think it was a very insightful discussion. So my question is, talking about translation from being an act of hostility to an act of hospitality, do you think that the opposition between cultural colonization and decolonization should be deconstructed since translation plays a double role in international cultural dialogues? Uh, y yes, I, I, and it's always being deconstructed. Right? It's always because, because of the fact that you can't, there's always going to be a certain uh, uh, aspect of undecidability. Does translation lead to world peace or does translation lead to certain powers becoming more powerful and other powers becoming less powerful, right? So there's always, there's always that, uh, uh, that, that question of uh, uh, what is translation actually doing? We have to pay attention to specific moments. It's very difficult to sort of, you know, uh, 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 generalize across the board. Right? It, it will depend on a, uh, uh, I mean, for example, I think of this conference. You know, I think of, I think of our, our meeting today, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying immensely by the way. But I'm also thinking, I mean, what, what would we sound like if instead of speaking in English, we spoke in French, for example. And unfortunately, my French is very, very bad, so I, I can't do that. Or what would happen if we were speaking in Arabic? I mean, I don't know how many, what are the other languages that, that you use when you all meet together? Is it all, you know, do you, do you, is it English, French, or do you also use Arabic when you have this conference? I, I don't know. But then the question, it, it's very interesting to ask, what difference would it make? What difference would it make if we were all speaking a different language, right? What kinds of questions would we be able to ask that we wouldn't be able to ask, yeah, for example, in English? Thank you. Where is Ben Ali? Hello, Mr. Rafael. Yes, yes. Well, you spoke about the advantages of uh, bilingualism. Uh, however, I think it's worth mentioning also uh, to speak about the gloomy side of the uh, of bilingualism. In fact, if the decision to suppress uh, a native language is made by individuals, then it's okay. But if the decision starts to be a collective choice, then uh, it will definitely lead to the death of uh, the language. And I can give you some examples such as India, where many languages died and other are dying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, that's, uh, that, which is why I say it's, it's very fraught. It's full of risks. It's full of dangers. Uh, this idea of bilingualism isn't simply this, this idea of, you know, being comfortable in multiple languages. It's also, uh, you know, it brings up this question of who decides which language uh, and uh, under what conditions and whether or not that will result in, in suppressing certain languages in favor of others. So it's, it's, very, it's a very risky uh, uh, task. Yeah. May I add another question related to, to, to bilingualism? And yeah. a person who is polyglot sometimes loses some of his own identity and roots. Mm -hmm. by allowing a foreign uh, language to suppress some of the roots. And this is the case of translators and interpreters, especially traveling interpreters. And there will be some break between your past and what you are living now, the communities yeah. in which you were born and raised and the community in which you are living now. So my question is about identity, whether uh, multilingualism, 
is a hostile setting for the identity of local people and local cultures and the vernacular mm -hmm. culture in particular in this case to, to, to explain more I have become aware of this and I started to do something about it by having recourse to my mother uh, there is a break as I've told you from the culture that I started with the terms that were used I started to interview my mother just to mm. tell me stories from the past mm. and recording the interviews will allow me the recordings will allow me later to uh, highlight the cultural elements that were there in the past uh, some of them they have I have experienced some of them not or the the, the terms they were used in a farming culture in particular so mm. I started to shape a sort of a motherful tongue not a motherless tongue in this sense so what are your thoughts on this identity yeah. fluency yeah. of uh, uh, fluency and multilingualism and the change yeah. of language over time yeah well first of all I think that's a great project what you're doing with your mother uh, accumulating stories but also using these stories as a way of understanding a certain world that is perhaps in the process of being lost right because in some ways uh, a, a translator uh, in terms of you know like you ask yourself well what is a translator I mean what is their identity and I think you you, you put your finger on it which is a translator always lives in exile uh, you're always forced into exile every time you translate uh, and uh, the question of exile is you know uh, in Edward Said for example writes beautifully about the question of exile where uh, it is a road towards cosmopolitanism right uh, you're you're a stranger everywhere which means that you're at home in the world uh, being a stranger everywhere at home in the world right so that's that's the advantages of exile in some ways, uh, but it can also mean alienation. It can also mean being cut off uh, uh, from, from your roots, from your past. Um, and it makes it very difficult to come to terms with, with what it is you've lost. And I think the, the fact that you have this project of, but of having- But Vicente, yeah. some of it is voluntary and not- Yeah, in yeah, sure. So you sure. allow some of yourself, sure. some of your culture, some of your identity to be taken uh, from you by the invading culture or the invading language. Right, right. But, but then, then the question is, what, what do you do with that loss? Right? Do, you, do you simply forget it? Or uh, is there a way of mourning it? Can you mourn that loss? Uh, and by mourning that loss, make, make it a part of you, not simply apart from you, but a part of you, a part of your own life, right? In, in the way you're trying to make uh, your, your mother's world, not simply something that you lose, but something that you want to incorporate within yourself. So my question here is identity uh, fixed or it is dynamic and everything that you can get even from uh, or through the window of another language can become also part of your identity. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and here it's perhaps the bridge again, the idea of bridge, you, you give and take. It is, mm -hmm. uh, so how, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I, I, the other way to think about identity also is something to use the, the imagery in your, in your lecture series, right? I, identity occurs, it happens, it's an event, right? And so where does it happen? Where, does, where do you, uh, take on an identity or when, it, when do you become who you are, usually it happens on the shores, on the shores of differences, right? You're standing on the beach and you can set yourself apart from the waters because you're on one side, the waters are on the other side, but then here comes a tsunami, 
or here comes a huge wave and it washes you away. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden your, your, your identity is gone and you're swimming in the ocean and you have to find another basis for identity, right? So, yeah, uh, thank you for spelling this out because the <laughs> image of uh, these encounters are encounters are the shores of translation. And yeah. the posters, there are posters showing images yeah. of the shore, shores yeah. of the waves of the sea. Exactly. Thank you for that. Yeah. Excuse me, yeah. doc, Dr. Professor. Yes, well. May I respond to your question? Yes. Uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, multilingualism is a double-edged sword. Yes. So you can use it to share your uh, culture and to uh, spread your, uh, ID your identity and thoughts, and then you are strengthening your identity or just using it to take from the uh, other languages and their culture. <laughs> and that will definitely weaken the uh, identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting because if you go to a lot of international conferences, you know, before there was, a, before there was the quarantine, <coughs> you go to these international conferences, and what's the language? Usually English, right? And if you're fluent in English, you thrive. You have more exchanges, you have interventions, etc. But if you're not fluent in English, you watch the people that aren't fluent in English, they just sit there and they're quiet and they listen, they understand, but because their fluency is less secure and less confident, they don't say anything, right? So you can see the inequality and, and the sort of double-edged sword of bilingualism that you were talking about, right? It's very difficult. I'm worried about time, time flies. Uh, and the interest uh, in the in the debate uh, really consumed time uh, very quickly. Yeah. We will take one last question uh, from Shiraz Manai, and then we will uh, wrap up. <coughs> Hello, good evening. Sorry, Hello. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm in the farm with my mom, so I don't have a very good uh, internet connection. So I just have something. To about the identity. I think uh, choosing to work as a translator and interpreter is uh, something that uh, pushes you to build your identity around the world and just knowing that your, your home is not in only one place. It is all around the world and be just, um, psychologically prepared to that. And Thank you very much for the lecture. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you're enjoying the farm. <laughs> yes, I am. I am working in the nature, so it's very, very good. It's very healthy. That's good. That's good. I, I'm very curious, though, uh, with your other speakers, what languages were you using? Uh, me? <coughs> no, the, the, the conference, the, the class. What, what languages? Um, were you using? So, um, uh, three languages, uh, Arabic ah. as a language A, English language B, and French as language C. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the most popular language is still Arabic for the most part. Yes, for this master's ah. program at least, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. It is the mother tongue, yeah. <laughs> so, well, it's wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Thank uh, you, thank you. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Hamouda, and I'm sorry for being absent these days. No <coughs> problem at all. You are enjoying uh, your the presence of your mother and 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 farming. And farming is a uh, farming the 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 land and earth is another mother also. So it is yeah. a metaphor for mother. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vicente, for this thank very you. rich and inspiring exchange of ideas over uh, issues of paramount importance to novice uh, translators and students. They need to understand, th they need to put things in context. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot be successful in, in, on the market uh, and um, running successful communications or communication projects without having a very clear idea uh, about those issues of language, translation, the role of translator, and 
the uh, tension there, uh, how language can be a bridge, how language or languages can be at war. So I think these are uh, very interesting interesting uh, subjects for, for students. Thank you very much for Thank enlightening yeah. us this yeah. evening. Uh, yeah. we, uh, re we are really grateful to you for accepting our invitation in, yeah. in, in this meeting, which yeah. is an encounter, uh, uh, encounter at the shores of translation. Thank you. Yeah, very and, 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 and I hope we can meet again without a catastrophe. Without a catastrophe, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been and a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.